Okay, so everybody, I'm going to start. I'm not um, <laughs> Sorry. Um, my name is Catherine Riglio. I teach in the nonfiction writing program. Uh, in the front here, we have many people from the public intellectual class, and everybody in here is it, on the panel actually took that class. Um, high powered writers all. Um, and what I'd like to do is I'm going to ask them to read just a little excerpt of, of projects that they are working on now and talk a little bit about some of the uh, <coughs> steps that you, you took to get that in motion, how you uh, conceived of the ideas, just some of the uh, little things uh, that might be interesting about the piece itself. Um, after that, I want them uh, and I'll, I'll try to make a demarcation, but I'd like them to talk a little bit about what it means to have a career in writing. Um, and right now we've got different years of, um, of graduation from Brown, so uh, people are at different stages in their writing career, and so I think uh, some of you are closer to a, a couple of people on the, on the panel, and then some people a little further out to talk about down the road. Right, and hopefully everybody here is interested in, in writing, and that's one of my goals of having this because they know a lot more about um, the actual practical things of getting out there, whereas I really don't know. I can't help you with that, so they can. So hopefully, they, I'll ask them to talk a little bit about careers and then open it up for questions. Of please direct it toward careers and writing, not so much on the on the content of the material. Okay, so I'm going to introduce Mimi Dwyer, who graduated in, uh, with a degree in English in 2013, correct me if I'm wrong, okay. And then um, she's working um, as, uh, at Reuters, but she's also doing freelance work, okay. Um, this is Dana Totorici, uh, who graduated in 2011.5. She's uh, a writer and uh, an editor at N Plus One, uh, and does has uh, done a lot of publications and uh, et, uh, also in back of some of the N Plus One's books. Um, then Natalie Villacorda, who uh, graduated just in 2013, she's down in Washington working for Politico. She has mixed feelings about uh, the kinds of things that she has to do to work at Politico. Uh, it kind of, uh, it differs from what her, her, she likes to do as a writer, so I hope she tells us some of these things that are bothering her. Sure. And then I think <laughs> the, old man, the old man of the group here is Andy Morantz, who's a, a staff writer and editor at The New Yorker. He graduated with a degree in uh, literary arts and religious studies uh, in uh, 2006.5, I believe. Natalie uh, graduated with a, a degree in English and bio, Dana with a degree of in, with English. So we're going to start with Mimi, who is going to tell us a little bit about what she's going to read and read a, a, a short extra now, a couple of minutes maybe. I'm not timing people anyway. <laughs> uh, okay, so tell us just a little bit about this piece and then read a little bit um, and maybe some, talk a little bit about some of the um, challenges of the piece. Okay? Go ahead. Sure. Um, yeah, so I wrote a piece for Vice um, over the past year about a group of Confederates that moved to Brazil in the 1860s um, and started a colony there um, in the aftermath of the Civil War. Um, and it's about um, the town that they founded and how their heritage sort of manifests. They have this big festival every year. Um, and then it's also about a case of contemporary slavery that was discovered in the same town in 2011 and then 2013. Um, and how those things are related um, or not related as the, as the case may be. Um, so yeah. Uh, Read a little bit. Okay. Yeah, no, we can ask you a couple of things. Okay, cool. Um, so I'll just read like the first part. Okay. Um, okay. Um, one day last spring, near an old rural cemetery in southern Brazil, a black man named Marcelo Gomez held up the corners of a Confederate flag to pose for a cell phone photo. After the picture was taken, 
Gomez said he saw no problem with a black man paying homage to the history of the Confederate States of America. American culture is a beautiful culture, he said. Some of his friends had Confederate blood. Gomez had joined some 2,000 Brazilians at the annual festa of the Fraternidade de Descendencia Americana, the Brotherhood of Confederate Descendants in Brazil, on a plot near the town of Americana, which was settled by Southern defectors 150 years ago. The graveyard is usually empty, save for its caretaker or the odd worshiper drawn to its little brick chapel. On the April morning of the festa, a public address system blaring the Confederate battle song Stonewall Jackson's Way had interrupted the cemetery's silence. Brazilians in 10-gallon hats and leather jackets called out greetings. For miles around the graveyard, unfiltered sun beat down on sugarcane fields planted by thousands of Confederates who had rejected Reconstruction and fled the United States in the wake of the Civil War, a voluntary exile that American history has more or less erased. Their scattered diaspora has gathered annually for the past 25 years. The party they throw, which receives funding from the local government, is the family reunion of the Confederados, one of the last remaining enclaves of the children of the unreconstructed South. Brazilians filed past a rebel flag banner emblazoned with the southern maxim, heritage, not hate. They lined up at a booth where they traded Brazilian reales for the festa's legal tender, print out Confederate dollar bills. The exchange rate was one to one. The southern economy had apparently survived. Kids flocked to the, tram uh, to the trampoline and moon bounce. Old timers staked out shape beneath white tents. Early on, the line for fried chicken grew almost too long to brave. Under a tent, I picked at some chicken and watched a young, Brazilian woman, a young blonde Brazilian woman maneuver an enormous Confederate hoop flag skirt into a chair. Um, I wondered what she made of the symbol. She introduced herself as Beatrice Stopa, a reporter for Glamour Brazil. Her grandmother, Rosemary Dodson, ran the Confederado fraternity. She'd been dancing at the festa since she was a kid. I asked if she knew there was a connection between slavery and the American South. I've never heard that before, she said. She wasn't sure why her ancestors had left the States. I know they came. I don't know. I don't really know the reason, she said. Is it because of racism? She smiled, embarrassed. Don't tell my grandmother. <laughs> Brazil itself outlawed slavery in 1888, more than two decades after the, Ameri the end of the American Civil War. Despite out outwardly progressive efforts since then, the country has struggled to rid itself of the institution. The government passed legislation strengthening worker protections, including a 1940 constitutional amendment prohibiting workers from submitting their prohibiting employers from submitting their workers to conditions analogous to slavery. But as Brazil grew more desperate to modernize in the early 20th century, farm owners started coercing wage laborers with debt and holding them in bondage. In recent years, government inspectors have found Brazilians trapped in debt on charcoal farms in Goiás, Haitian workers who died on World Cup construction sites, and Bolivian immigrants in sweatshops at the center of Sao Paulo. Okay. Tell us now um, uh, how you got that to print. What gave you the idea of, of pursuing this? I, I know you have a little bit of a background and in, in interest in this, but tell us how, how that um, got even accepted by Vice. All right. So tell us a little bit about your thought uh, process and your, your getting that to uh, be realized. Yeah. Um, well, so I, I wrote my thesis in nonfiction about historical reenactment, um, not about the Confederados, but I came across them through that. And I was aware of these people who did, uh, these Confederates who had moved and founded huh. this colony. Um, and so that's how I knew about them. Uh, and I wanted to write about them, but there was, you know, I had no way of going, I didn't really, there wasn't really a story, and I didn't want, just want to do a piece that was like, look at this weird yeah. festival. Um, so um, I got an email from this editor at Vice that, uh, that Dana actually put me in touch with, um, <laughs> who, which said, which said like, where it was soliciting pitches, and I was like, oh, I have this thing that is like extremely Vicey, but I knew that like the like alone um, the festival was not going to be something that they were going to like fund me to go do. Um, so I had this roommate who worked on Brazil issues, and I was talking to him about it, and he was like, "Well, what about contemporary slavery in Brazil?" And then we started looking into it, and there had been this case in Americana, and I was like, "Aha! Um, that is the way to do this piece." Okay. Um, and so you got funding. Yes, yeah. They well, so this was complicated. Um, they they took the piece and Vice uh, has a print has like a print magazine or like it started as as a print magazine, but like most of their money goes to video stuff now. So they were like, okay, if you want to do this as a print piece, um, 
we can give you like X amount or we can give you like, you know, we can spend like 10 times that on a like documentary, um, but we can come down and like, we'll have a vice person like host the like video version of your story. Um, so I was like, okay, like that, if that's how it's gonna happen. Um, so I went down with a, and I, I was super excited. Um, so I went down there with my editor who was also like trying out to like host vice documentaries. Um, like doing mm -hmm. like we were sort of co-reporting in this very strange mm -hmm. way um and then there was like a camera guy and and i went once in um april for the festa and we were supposed to go on a raid uh with the brazilian police but it got canceled and so we almost had to cancel the whole trip um but then we ended up going back to like in june um, and then that didn't even end up in the piece at all. And the documentary is like kind of in the works. So it's just like, you know, a lot of like moving parts. And... Okay, so complications to go for you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just to get one piece printed. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay, good. And maybe people will have more questions after. Okay. Dana. All okay. right. So Dana's going to talk, read from. Okay, yeah. Okay. Um, so I, uh, I work, I edit a magazine called M Plus One. I think Catherine assigns it in class. Um, and this is a piece that I've written that's coming out in the next issue. It's not out yet. It's coming out in April. Um, and it's a very long review of all of the novels of Elena Ferrante. I don't know if you guys, do you guys know about Elena Ferrante? It's amazing. Um, she's a contemporary Italian novelist who is incredibly, incredibly good. Um, and she has become something of a sensation because she refuses to disclose who she is. It's a How many name. people are reading her here? No, none. A few. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> yeah, you should. It's, it's really good. But so she's like a living, she's a living master. Um, and so there's been a huge publicity swirl around her. Who is Elena Ferrante? Like, is she a man? These Italian newspapers have speculated that she is a man. Um, and but I, so I, I've seen all of this. I've read all of her novels, and I was really disappointed by the way her writing was being treated because I felt people were not looking at the novels at all. They were kind of just like trying to sell newspapers. Um, and so I wrote... Yeah, how did you get, get uh, onto her? What, what did um, you so mean? she, I had been told about her work by um, my co-editor, Nikhil Saval, who okay. reads Italian. And so he had read her in Italian years before. Um, but she got kind of picked up when James Wood in The New Yorker wrote a very big, very glowing piece about um, one of her novels called My Brilliant Friend, that was the first in this series that she's written about Naples. And is that when you started to read her? Um, yes, so I started okay. to read after the James Wood piece came out. Okay. Um, and so one of the other things, the sort of goal, the object of this piece was also to connect her later work to her early work, which most reviewers don't do because it's so expansive, it's hard to do it. Um, which is why I could do it for M plus one, because you can write 10,000 words of literary criticism in M plus one. Um, and I also wanted to make a connection to um, this school of Italian feminism that was very prominent in the 70s in Milan, uh, from which she borrows actually a lot of her, not borrows, but she's very influenced by it. A lot of her concepts come from this. Um, and I, it, a lot of the novels are what people describe as female friendship, as their sort of central uh, motif, but I, I really hate that phrase. I think it's like infantilizing and stupid, and like people just say it because it's alliterative. Um, and so, <laughs> so I really, um, and so I uh, was really thrilled when I came up, came across this this uh, Italian feminist school. Um, and so I will just read part of the piece that when I sort of introduce um, what this was called. Um, and just for a little bit of context, I'm talking about um, a novel, her third novel before the series, which is called The Lost Daughter. Um, and it's a, it's a very weird book. Um, it's about this woman who goes to a beach town and kind of becomes obsessed with this young mother that she sees on the beach. Um, and the, the, there's some weird entanglement between them and Suze, and it's not clear whether, like, She's in, they're in love with each other, or they have like some sort of friendship. They're very, you know, they're like maybe like 40, 50 years apart. Um, and so, I say, you know, you can reduce this to a kind of like boring Oedipal lesbian story, um, but it's actually a reflection of this paradigm from Italian feminist thought of the 70s, which is called entrustment or affidamento. Um, so I'll just read here. 
An Italian critic was once asked Ferrante by correspondence mediated through her publisher, have you had a psychoanalytic type of education, a feminist kind? The answer was no. Ferrante denied having any expertise in psychoanalysis and wrote that to attribute a feminist outlook to her was an exaggeration. She was, she suggested, too shy for such strong positions. Quote, owing in particular to limitations of character, which I've struggled to accept, I've never exposed myself publicly or taken sides. I don't have the physical courage that, in general, is required for these things. But within this timid frame, she wrote, I can say that I am slightly interested in psychoanalysis and fairly interested in feminism, and that I am sympathetic to the ideas of difference feminism. In another letter to her editor, later published in a book of collected inter interviews called La Fra or Frontumaglia, translated this time as fragments, it it's shows up in all of her other work and they translate it differently. Um, Ferrante wrote about her ambitions for her first novel, Troubling Love. Should I make an offering to the feminine theme of learning to love one's mother? Actually, thinking about it, I'd really like to do this. I'll find a way to develop my theme to the point where I can cite Luz Irigaray and Luisa Moraro. Moraro, an Italian feminist and historian largely unfamiliar to American readers, was a founder of the Libreria delle Donne di Milano, or Milan Women's Bookstore Collective, in 1975, a group whose writings shaped the Italian interpretation of Irigaray's theory of sexual difference. The concept of entrustment was one of their chief contributions to feminist theory. In the 1970s, American radical and mainstream feminism called for sisterhood. Hierarchies and competition were the constructs of men, went the thinking, and sisterhood was the great leveler. Camaraderie would undo the self-hatred and mutual hostility women had cultivated over centuries of subordination. But differences between women were undeniable, and not only on grounds of race, class, and sexuality. The regime of sameness also failed to comprehend differences in strength and personality taste and desire. Missing from sisterhood, the Italians argued, were mothers and daughters, and they questioned whether the insistence on sisterhood, to them most manifest in the political fight for equality inherited from the youth movement, was a reaction to the obliteration of the mother in our society. Men were the ones who saw women as equals once the mother was removed. After the mother, all women were losers, equally available for domination. The Milan Women's Bookstore Collective therefore encouraged women to seek out symbolic mothers and symbolic daughters, and to build a tissue of preferential relationships. To entrust <coughs> oneself, Moraro wrote, meant to tie yourself to a person who can help you achieve something which you think you are capable of, but which you have not yet achieved. In her Introduction to Sexual Difference, a collection of the bookstore's writings, Teresa de Laredes described entrustment as a relationship in which one woman gives her trust, or entrusts herself symbolically to another woman, who thus becomes her guide, mentor, or point of reference. In short, the figure of symbolic mediation between her and the world. For a woman to entrust herself to another woman, a symbolic mother, likely, but not necessarily older, who possesses something extra, meant to bridge the gap a woman feels between her aspiration to a free existence and the privacy of her sex body. Women did not wish to think about motherhood all their lives, for example, but neither did they want to treat maternity as a dilemma in conflict with freedom or deny it as a source of truth. Nor did they want to enter the social world at the expense of their most elementary experiences, those associated with the body and sexuality. Emancipation had created space for women to pursue bigger lives than the ones their mothers had lived, but this required a kind of asexual presence. To be at ease among men, a woman had to remove the threat of her body from the scene, unless her body and its availability was what she wished to broadcast. Mm. Such equality was far from freedom. Only to reference by those like us, wrote the Milan Women's Bookstore Collective, will we be able to rediscover and therefore support the, those contents of our experience which social reality ignores or tends to cancel out as scarcely relevant. The goal was not a static separatism, but a way into the social world of men through a common world of women, a world in which women could aid, validate, and learn from one another as they form their identities among but independent of men. Even more ambitiously, they, thought, they sought through the concept of entrustment to create a new symbolic register, one defined not by the father, the phallus, the singular truth of Eric Gray's critique, but by the mother-daughter relationship. Okay, cool. Now, tell <coughs> us how long that took to um, write this, this piece from start to finish. Well, when did you start working on it? Um, so I started reading the novels in 2013. Um, and I knew that I wanted to write about Ferrante, and I, had, I was familiar with Italian feminist theory. Um, 
but it actually wasn't until <coughs> maybe December um, when I decided I had to write it now or I would never write it. Um, because it was just, you know, I'm, I'm an editor mostly, and so it's very easy to kind of channel all of my writing energy into, you know, mm -hmm. helping other people mm -hmm. uh, sort out their pieces. Um, and it really was, like, to give you some sort of, like, candid publishing insider talk, like, uh, the problem was that my co-editor and I were trying to figure out programming for the next issue, and there were, like, very few pieces by women coming in, and we were very worried that our gender balance was going to be really off. Um, and it's, some, it's very important to me that this is, does not happen in the magazine, it's something that I care a lot about. And so I figured, okay, I just have to write it, I have to do it. And so I'm um, very lucky, you know, I was able to take like three consecutive Fridays off from work to stay home and do it, but it's also because I'm writing for a magazine that does not pay me for writing. Um, so, uh, but I, it's the fastest I've ever written anything. I think wow. I wrote in about two months. Wow. Very yeah. Okay, we'll get back to you. <laughs> All right. All right, now Natalie <coughs> from Politico. Sure. Okay, so this piece, um, it's called The Politics of the Selfie. Uh, I basically <coughs> wrote it for fun um, when, I, it was a while ago, so sorry if I don't make sense. Actually, it was almost a year ago that I wrote this piece. Um, and what am I supposed to talk about? How I got the idea for it? So yeah. I'm obsessed with selfies, as I'm sure many of you guys are. I love to take them, <laughs> and I love looking at them, and I just think selfies are great. I work at a publication that writes about politics and policy, um, which is not a subject that I know a lot about before I started working there. Um, so uh, at the time of writing this piece, I was working on the breaking news desk at Politico, um, I'm actually a healthcare reporter, but I just did a stint on the breaking news desk to sort of learn how that goes. I spent a lot of time on Twitter looking for stories, and just being on Twitter, I noticed that a lot of politicians were taking selfies, and I also watched a lot of TV news. That was also part of my job. Also noticed, so basically the point is I just saw like a lot of selfies happening, and I was like, okay, this seems like a trend, I'm gonna write about it, so. And how do you get that accepted? Um, How do you so I work there, so right. it's easy to get things accepted okay. once you work at a place. They're not saying, no, you can't do that. Oh, no, definitely not. Um, so, I mean, my, my sort of my, like, morning, my, like, morning job was that I had to, like, deal with, like, daily news coming in, but then if I had, like, a larger idea that I wanted to pursue, an enterprise idea, they call it, um, then I could just pitch that idea and basically just work on it uh, whenever I wanted. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. So I can read a little bit about yes, it. Please. It might be super dated, I'm sorry. That's all right. Um, <laughs> President Barack Obama may think Ellen DeGeneres' wild, wildly retweeted Oscar selfie was a cheap stunt, but it's one that he and other politicians are lately using more often themselves, and for good reason. Elected officials are increasingly employing the selfie as a digital age tool to appear as authentic, accessible, and spontaneous to the public, even while what's often underlying their growing use of the self-snapped photos is a calculated effort at control and careful image making, experts said. During an episode of the Ellen DeGeneres show this week, the host gloated to Obama that her selfie had shattered the president's record for the for the four more years, oh wait, had shattered the, the president's record. I heard about that, Obama responded. I thought it was a pretty cheap stunt myself, getting a bunch of celebrities in the background. You're feeding them pizza. Today, the selfie is king. Chelsea and Hillary Clinton took one last June. A few months later, former President Bill Clinton shot a selfie with Bill Gates, noting two bills. One selfie. <laughs> <laughs> Former President George H.W. Bush recently posed for one with the country singer Brad Paisley, and soon after, Bush's wife Barbara smiled for her own with Steve's, with Fox's Steve Ducey. <coughs> Last week, Former Secretary of State Col Colin Powell got in, got in on the action by posting on Facebook a selfie he took 60 years ago, before anyone had even heard of a selfie. <laughs> Senator Jeff Flake recently experienced the power of the selfie when he posted one uh, with entrepreneur Mark Cuban on Twitter. Flake tweeted the photo he took out to his 23,000 followers, writing, My kids aren't impressed by much, but a shark selfie with Mark Cuban? That'll do it. 
Cuban, who appears on the show Shark Tank, that is regularly that is regular viewing through the Flake family, retweeted it to his more than two million followers. And over the next 24 hours, Flake's Twitter following exploded. The senator's first inclination had been to post a photograph of he and Cuban taken by someone else. But Cuban proposed a selfie instead, telling Flake, that's what people like. Politicians were always trying to look hip, Flake said in an interview. If I had to choose between a regular post photo, which we do thousands of, or a selfie with a celebrity or someone well-known, you take the latter. It's just more personal. Blake's experience illustrates a strategy that politicians and their handlers have taken note of. In a world where politicians are often packaged and marketed and kind of touting a brand, the authentic things get more attention, said Eric Smith, who worked on Obama's presidential campaigns and has since founded his own strategic communications firm, Blue Engine Message and Media. The, pol the politicians who are most successful on social media manage their accounts themselves, Smith said, and selfies are one way they can convey that authenticity so it is valued. Politicians who know how to engage social media authentically have a leg up on those who don't, because it's a way to re relate to voters in a more accessible way, he added. One, thing, one way of thinking about the selfie is the digital handshake between politician and constituent, said Jen Nidu, senior director at Bully Pulpit Interactive. With Twitter and other primarily written platforms, the public doesn't always know who is really tweeting or writing, but selfies eliminate any barrier to entry for the viewer, she said. Yeah, no, that's great. Okay. Um, so, um, you have to do a lot of calling for that? Or um, what were you doing to get that, that material? So, a lot of it was just like observation um, and research online, just like online research. a lot of like Googling, like politician selfie, mm -hmm. and like, <laughs> then like looking at different politicians' Twitter feeds and like just calling stuff. And then because I work at a um, pretty traditional place. Um, I can't have these opinions myself. I have to say that an expert has these opinions. So that's why, like, sometimes there's like comma expert said um, because I like would call up various like media experts and have them sort of like talk out the Ask ideas. Ask them leading questions. Yeah. <laughs> I, I guess these are people who other people have paid to like run their social media for them. Okay. These are people who work on like campaigns or like do no, advertising. Professors of modern culture. Yeah, no. <laughs> actually no. So actually I emailed some brown professors. I like, <laughs> yeah, no. I, I, <laughs> I emailed some of my friends who were modern culture and media uh, majors here. Like, and I, and I, I was do like, not know who Obama is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's his Yeah, no, no, I emailed them and I was like, are there like people in the world who, who are like experts on selfies and it was like it was kind of hard to find experts on selfies but that was the goal. <laughs> and just one other question, how often do you have a byline for that? Um, a lot, but I so I work on the subscriber side of the publication, so a lot of the content that I write is behind a paywall. Um, politico.com which this piece appeared on, um, it's free, anybody can read it and I have fewer bylines on there because they try to protect our content for payers. But if I have a story that's like about Obamacare, um, often that goes in front of the paywall because people like to read that. Great. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So let's let's hear from Andrew. Mm -hmm. um, that was before Obama used a selfie stick. You should do an update. Oh my God! You're right. Yeah. <laughs> I you can imagine what he was like in class. <laughs> <laughs> I made a, a short section of this piece um, that was in the New Yorker uh, a couple months ago. Um, it's it's about a guy who runs uh, several viral content mill websites, um, and I'm going to read a short section of it that is not that I'm not reading because it, the prose is so lush or notable or anything, but because it's instructive to talk about how this section like changed um, editorially so uh, so yeah basically he's a guy who you know does puts memes out into the world um, so the first section is sort of basically describing what that is and this is the second section I had met Sparts a few weeks earlier at a dinner during a tech industry conference in Manhattan when I asked him what he did for a living he replied I'm passionate about virality I must have looked confused because he said, let me bring that down from the 30,000 foot level. <laughs> the appetizer course had not yet arrived. 
he checked the time on his cell phone and cleared his throat. <laughs> Every day, when I was a kid, my parents re made me read four short biographies of very successful people, he began. This is an echo of the speech he gave in the first section. On this occasion, I was the only person listening to his speech, but he spoke in a distant and deliberate tone, using studied pauses and facial expressions, as if I were a video camera's lens. When he got to the part about virality being a superpower, quote, I realized that if you could make ideas go viral, you could tip elections, start movements, revolutionize industries. I asked whether that was really true. Can you rephrase your question in a more concrete way, he said. <laughs> I mentioned Kony 2012, a 30-minute film about the Ugandan militia leader Joseph Kony. It has been viewed on YouTube more than 100 million times, but it did not achieve its ultimate goal. Kony remains at large, as does his militia, the Lord's Resistance Army. To be honest, I didn't follow too closely after the whole thing died down, Spartz said. Even though I'm one of the most avid readers I know, I don't usually read straight news. <laughs> it's conveyed in a very boring way, and you tend to see the same patterns repeated again and again. I, I'm showing a lot of restraint by not imitating his voice. <laughs> he went on, if I were running a more hard news-oriented media company, and I wanted to inform people about Uganda, first, I would look it up and find out exactly what's going on there. Then, I would find a few really poignant images or storylines, one that create a lot of resonant emotion, and I would make those into a short video, under three minutes, with clear, simple words and statistics. Short, declarative sentences. And at the end, I'd give people something they can do, something to feel hopeful about." End quote. Sparts left before dessert, which he called, quote, a low return on investment calorically. <laughs> <laughs> on his way out, he sent me an email as an aid memoir. The subject line read, hi, stay in touch. And the entire text of the email was, viral guy. <laughs> Um, so that so that section is, I think, instructive because that was kind of so this that, that was obviously the first time I met this guy. I sort of met him by accident. I had actually gone to this tech conference to report on someone else who stood me up. So I was just sort of like wandering around talking to people at random, and I was seated literally randomly next to him at dinner. And I was like, how am I going to get through this dinner? I mean, within five minutes, I was like, this is going to be bad. And but I just decided. I wasn't thinking of it as a repertorial exercise. I was just like, well, we're sitting here, and I'm, I'm hungry, so I'm going to stay. And so I'm just going to tell this guy what I think. So he started telling me his spiel. And he was at an industry conference where you could tell no one was like opposing any of his values. And so I just said, like, I think what you're doing is pretty scary. Like, I don't think. And he was confident enough in his vision that, he, that we had an actual conversation. Um, which like helped me in my like karmic accounting of this later when I wrote a pretty harsh piece about him. I was like, he knew what I thought the whole time. <laughs> um, and so this was my first encounter and I, I knew that I had wanted to write something about like how the internet was changing media and blah 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 and that seemed like kind of just a gassy kind of essay topic and very broad and part of what I like about the, there are things I don't like, but part of what I like about the way the New Yorker uh, focuses things is that there, it's often, I think, more interesting to write a profile or, or, a, or a reported piece that's making an argument rather than, hi, I'd like to make this argument, okay, now I'm finished. So when he came along, I sort of wrote basically this in an email to my editor saying, do you think this guy's interesting? And it sort of ended up in the piece, but the way it changed was it got very toned down and very, like in the, there was a lot more stuff the way I wrote it the first time that was just clobbering you over the head with how much I hate this guy. <laughs> and, and it just didn't serve, uh, it, it, it just seemed snide and like over, it just, it just wasn't necessary. Like there was a line, like when he says, oh, I stopped uh, paying attention after the whole thing died down, I had a line about like, by the whole thing, he meant the media campaign, not the ongoing human rights atrocities. That, you know, and my editor was just like, you don't need, like, you don't, it's obvious, you know? So that whole, and it got much shorter, and that, and, and so it, you know, it was in there as a, as a way of positioning me in the piece, but it wasn't like, you know, ham handed or anything. Did, th during that dinner conversation, was it on the record? Well, I went back to him afterwards and sort of said, hey, I might like to write about you. I'm going to come out to Chicago next month. Um, 
and he is all about, as a lot of these tech guys are, like transparency and radical honesty and like, this is what I think. And by the way, he, as you can tell, is sort of like a tape loop of a guy. So he, I could have gotten to say all this stuff again if I wanted to, right. but you know, I, I just, yeah, that was all. Yeah. He, he didn't show any sign of like embarrassment of, about any of it. And like, and we just genuinely have different beliefs about these things. It wasn't like a surreptitious like gotcha moment. It was like, this is what he believes and I mm -hmm. think he's wrong. How long did it take you to write it? Um, a couple months, uh, off and on. I, very similarly to Dana, like have an editorial and, and writing component to my job, so it was like in between and stuff. I went to Chicago twice and kind of wrote up different parts of it, um, and then was just kind of um, waiting for the right moment to run it. Um, mm -hmm. And actually, we were talking um, at after the stuff happened with the New Republic seemed like a good time to run it. Even though that's not mentioned in the piece. Mm -hmm. I was trying to think if there was another... Anybody quickly have a question to, to, about the piece? About make, get creating that piece? Um, you do have an analysis of the end there. I, I, I think that's uh, quite strong without, be, without positioning yourself it's true, yeah. The, there is a there is a section towards the end of the piece where it is me making an argument, but yeah, I think in the context of positioning it around a concrete person, to me anyway, it felt less like soapboxy and more grounded right. in the, the facts. Did you so? Did, what kind of feedback uh, response did you get to the for the piece? I know I know that it was picked for a long. I think it was long form pick of the week. I I was I was. Um, in the middle of the desert in Bolivia when it came out, so I don't, so you, I don't know, but, really know, but I mean, I do, I, but I got, um, I mean, I got a lot of emails from people that were just like, "Wow, that's the worst person in the world." That's the worst. <laughs> there was a lot of like, "This is the scariest thing the New Yorker has ever run," and I was like, "Well, we just had a piece about Congo, and you know, I don't think it's the scariest thing we've ever <laughs> run." But, um, but people obviously, it's something that people are afraid of. Because the, the, the ultimate thing is not just this guy and his dweeby ideas about whatever, it's that he really believes in the market always being right. And that like what people want is good because it's the invisible hand dictating what is good. And he uses the word good and effective and successful all interchangeably, consistently. So that I think struck a nerve because everybody is seeing this, this media world where you're all Everyone's bragging about page views and Twitter followers and blah this and that and there and it and this and it sort of was like oh I didn't know that there were people who were so unashamed about that and mm -hmm. not only did that sort of as a cynical business move but as a like life plan. Yeah. Okay. Good. So now let's go on and, and ask <coughs> the other set of questions about you know your uh, path to getting to where you are where, you, where what you hope to be doing, particularly for Mimi and uh, Natalie, um, you know, the path from uh, doing a senior thesis to, you know, graduating and then uh, some of you did internships. Um, so go ahead, we'll start with Mimi and then, then we can open it up and you guys can ask questions and then we'll stop and hopefully you'll have a chance to, to talk to them individually. I think that would be useful. We've got a lot of, how many writers here, uh, BDH? Uh, in, indie writers, uh, any kind of writing, writing uh, folks, a lot of, lot of you. So, um, it's for you. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Uh, yeah. So I graduated in 2013, um, and I went to do uh, the reporter research. This job at the New Republic um, called like it was like a fellowship uh, reporter researcher thing. Um, I started in July, right after I graduated. Um, and at the time, uh, paid. Yeah, yeah, paid. yeah. Not, not, not much, but yes. Okay. Um, so yeah, so I had this job in DC. I, I like TNR was like historically a like sort of wonky political magazine and had been bought by a Facebook guy um, who was going to revolutionize it into uh, the like so-called New Yorker of DC. Um, and so he, there was like a lot of er, you know excitement around. That and I just thought it would be a good time to try, or I, I was excited about it for that reason because like I didn't know what was going to happen, um, and 
uh, yeah, so I, I got there and there were, I mean, it was bumpy, like, it was definitely, I got a first-hand sort of look into these, the cultures that, like, you know, Andrew's piece deals with, uh, clashing. Um, you were there when all that stuff happened? No, oh, the I first had left, part of Hughes. yeah, like, mm -hmm. Hughes' initial sort of reign, um, and so, went to Brown. Yeah, yeah, you did. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so it was, I mean, it was, I like learned really important skills. Like, I learned how to fact check, I like learned how to report. Um, but I also sort of got a sense of how directionless, like, and scary it is to be a young person in media. Um, and that really like informed the way that I've thought about stuff since then um, because it doesn't make sense for example to like get really invested in like X magazine that you work at because like you just or like you know or content company or whatever it is um, <coughs> because it might not exist it's not going to exist in like a year um, or two years in the form that it does now um, so yeah so I moved to New York um, and got a job at Reuters as a researcher um, which is great um, and it gives me a lot of latitude to freelance stuff like this piece. Um, and I've also like been working with the investigative team there, which is a lot of fun. Um, okay. And maybe someone will ask you later what, what kind of things you're researching. But let's okay. So let's just get everybody's career paths out and then um, questions. Um, yeah. So I, I graduated point five because I took a, a semester off my junior year. A brown after working at the indie um, because I really liked um, working at a publication and just running production and everything that went into it and I wanted to do more of it um, so I took an internship at M plus one knowing very little about the magazine also about New York media um, I worked as a freelance graphic designer babysitter fact checker at Us Weekly um, Fascinating. Those jobs pay really well, actually. Fact-checking jobs are good. Um, and uh, interned at the magazine at a kind of crucial time because they were having a big staff turnover. You know, meaning like their one person who was a paid employee left. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, it they relied very heavily on me to do stuff to basically keep the organization afloat. And so, you know being an undergraduate, I was just very happy for the opportunity to do something that mattered instead of like doing busy work that they created just to keep me occupied so that like I could put an internship on my resume. Um, and so I became like very loyal to them, but very grateful to them for kind of letting me actually do work there while I was still like 21 years old. Um, so a degree. Yeah, yeah, they didn't yeah. care. Um, yeah. You know, and Andrew Leland, who works at the Believer, I wonder, is he still there? I think so. Yeah, I mean, Andrew, I think Dave Eggers got him to drop out of college to be the managing editor of the Believer, like, because they, you know, they were just like, you're great, come work here. Um, and I think that a lot of small magazines, literary magazines, are like that. They kind of just, like, need people. Um, Dave Eggers is all about keeping people out of school. Yeah, <laughs> I'm out of school. Um, but so, yeah, so I. Um, so I stayed at Plus One for about eight months, um, doing various odd jobs in New York. Came back to Brown, finished, uh, worked there, back at M Plus One as subscriptions manager for a summer. Um, just sort of like stayed around. The organization is like slightly unique in that it's it's a nonprofit. All of the editorial staff is unpaid. Um, there's three, four, three people who are paid full time, um, and that's it. And for doing managing ed managing editor, my position deputy managing editor and a business manager, and we just run the mm -hmm. whole organization. Um, and so, because everyone was unpaid, there was no real like barrier to participating. Like They were like, oh, well, we can't let you do that because like we can't pay you to do that. And it was kind of just like, yeah, I got an idea, go for it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I stuck around with them. They hired me part-time right out of college, um, and then I just stayed there. Um, so, yeah. so yeah, so it's just also like speaking to what Mimi said, like you could also take the other path, which is like, it's true, if you work for like a big media company, like you, 
who knows what's going to happen to it because like I don't think anybody's going to like buy M plus one in the next like five years. Um, but it is equally precarious and so but you can like be like I love this magazine, I love this publishing house, I love this poetry press, whatever, um, and like make that your thing if you like want to make that your project. And so you're not mind. getting outside, you're not working outside, you're, that's, no. where, that's your project? Yeah, full time. I mean, I freelance, you know, so I, okay. uh, I'll occasionally take assignments for, you know, like book reviews or random, random things. Um, they don't pay amazingly well. No. So, you know, but it's more just kind of like practice to like publish, if, you know, work with different editors mm -hmm. who have different house styles. It's, you know, just very elucidating. And M plus one is unusually good about talking about money and how those things work. And they had a labor form where they talk in, in the previous issue about how labor works at different magazines. They put out a book about how writers make money. So they're yeah. very aware of yeah. it's a space where it's okay to talk about how to make a living, which yeah. is really useful. Yeah. Uh, let's see, is it 19 and 20 or 20, issue 20 and 21? But Issues yeah, 21 was the yeah 20 was the, the artist payment. Right, we read the uh, 20, yeah. and the 20, 21, 21 the labor uh, issues are really dealing with uh, yeah. those. Okay. Uh, uh, go ahead. Now. Okay, so, so I for your path, and don't forget you did have a lot of internships in science before you. Began. Yeah. Um, so I uh, graduated in 2013, and before I graduated, I I like had this idea that I was going to be a science writer for a while, so like I did the BDH thing and in summers I had a couple internships and each internship kind of led to the next internship um, and when I graduated I didn't have a job but I had lined up a summer internship and I went to work at the Cleveland Plain Dealer which is, sorry I'm smiling, <laughs> it's okay, <laughs> um, because it's um, uh, so it, there used to be this big um, internship program through this organization called the Kaiser Family Foundation that um, funded journalists who were interested in health. So they gave me money to go work at this newspaper. I worked there um, until the end of um, August and then I didn't have a job because they laid off like uh, two thirds of their staff and I didn't want to work there anyways. Mm -hmm. um, but I came home and I didn't have a job, which is totally okay guys, I just want to say for all you freaking out seniors, like, it's okay to move home. I, that was the message that I really wanted to get out to you guys, that it's okay to move home. Because um, I moved home and actually it was really great. And so for two months I was freelancing for actually a publication here in Providence. Um, and was like super close to moving back to Providence. Um, I'm from DC, so I was living at home in DC. I was really close to moving back to Providence to work for this, uh, for work for Providence Business News full time. Uh, writing about healthcare, um, but right before I almost moved back here, I got this job at Politico, and that's where I've been working since uh, since October 2013. Um, so yeah, I mean, basically my career path has just been like internship, 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 and then get hired um, <laughs> at a publication. <laughs> um, but as I will, I'm sure we can get into um, there. I like there. Good things about having a job as a full-time journalist, you have a salary, um, <laughs> but also it means that you write the way that your publication wants you to write, and you write about the things that they're interested in, and you write in the style that they write in. And that can be um, suffocating <laughs> if you also like to write in other ways. Um, and so um, the thing that I've been trying to do um, at the same time uh, as my job is right outside of work, um, obviously like freelancing is um, an option, it's something that I've started to do, but also just like <coughs> writing whatever you want, whenever you can, mm -hmm. outside of work too. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. <coughs> um, I was uh, a point fiver -er also. Uh, I was, I took a semester off to, uh, I was in India and I just stayed there for a semester. Um, and then, so I was graduating late and I was not really good on the internship thing um, and I didn't I had, um, I had published one thing while I was in school with Slate that was like an outgrowth of some research I was doing um, with a Royce fellowship do they still have those? Yes. Yeah. Um, so I had figured I had sort of said well what can I do it was an issue that was important to me it was about um, prison gerrymandering which is still 
a big thing um, that hasn't really been fixed. And um, I wanted it to be, you know, I just wanted it to be out there and I didn't know how to do that. And so I sort of asked someone at, at the NGO who, who was helping me and he had a friend at Slate and they published it. And so I was like, oh, so you can take something that is a piece of writing that's important to you, but also just get it out there where a bunch of people can see it. And so that sort of happened by accident, but I, it wasn't anything that had ever really occurred to me before. You know, I tended, I definitely read Conjunctions more than I read Slate. And then I was like, oh, there's, there's like many ways that things can be propagated. So I uh, applied for the TNR job, didn't get it, and then just didn't know what to do. I mean, there aren't very many jobs like that. Um, so. I uh, started freelancing um, for, and then I ended up freelancing for like four or five years. I went, um, I found a freelance gig that paid the bills at the Times, which was just a very menial um, sort of, uh, you know, Bartleby type job of like just putting stuff, <coughs> putting stuff online when the, you know, HTML was all screwed up and I mean, I, I, and I didn't know, I, I wasn't a good coder, they were just like, you can figure this out. So I did that for, and luckily they needed a lot of work done so I could work as many hours as I wanted to and then just pitch stuff on the side. So I was pitching everyone, everything that I could think of and most of it was not appropriate at all for the publication or they didn't know who I was and they were never going to actually respond to my email or, so I just really figured out the hard way how to make it work and then over time and I started writing things for the New York Press and the Village Voice, and then I started writing things for New York Magazine, and then I did something for Mother Jones, and then I did something for Harper's, and that this is like the short version. But over time, I sort of figured out how to make the freelancing thing work, and then at some point, I did a, a master's at NYU that didn't take up all my time, so I could still freelance while I was doing that. And through that, I met someone at the New Yorker, and then ended up at the New Yorker. And then that job has changed over time too, but. It was all very, the part of the reason that I got the New Yorker job was because I had been thinking like a freelancer for so long, so when they said, what are your ideas, like what ideas would you want to be in the magazine, because a big part of the job was idea generation for the magazine, what should we be writing about, how should we be approaching things, I knew how to pitch something that wasn't just like, what about North Korea, that's pretty interesting, like, you know, or like, do you, do you guys know about politics? Like, it was like very focused, this is happening now, this is why it's of interest in this month, this is when it should be published, this is who should write it, this is how they should attack it, this is how much it would cost, this is whether you could get access or not. Like, those are the kinds of things that a freelancer has to come pre-equipped. You, you have to sell them on all that stuff because they're always looking for a reason to say no. So, that was sort of the thing that got me in the door there. And I remember the last time you were here, you you, you emphasized not that you may be change this may have changed for you, but you really emphasized that you kept you keep pitching. Oh yeah. Uh, uh, you know, to uh, if they say no, you throw out another idea. Now, yeah. I don't know if that's changed for you now as yeah, yeah, you yeah, developed well, or because uh, you were pitching sort of blindly uh, originally. Right? Yeah, I try I, tr I, tr I try to do more things now that are like people that I know or you know less blind, but it's definitely the case that people. I know now as an editor that the difference between a polite rejection and an impolite rejection and a polite rejection is like, I read your pitch, this isn't for us, you know, maybe it says try us again. Or like, that's a huge difference from like, ignore or no, you know? Yeah. If it says, I, I, you know, what other ideas do you have or anything like that, then that's like feeding a puppy. I'm just like, mm -hmm. uh, I'll give you, and this actually, the, the, um, the, this plays into the gender imbalance thing because one of the things that Vita says is that like uh, this is a this is a socialized gender difference that like men are socialized to be like hi do you like me do you like me now hi can I come back you know and and a lot of women and I I run into this as an editor too where a, a lot of women are more put in the position of being like oh sorry to have wasted your time you know and so that's something that I actually have tried to, I mean, it's a tough thing to talk about, it's like not, it's um, sort of, and it's not the only, it's but by no means the only way to explain that, but that gap, but um, it's a very important thing, I think, particularly for female freelancers to keep doing be it. a little annoying, yeah. Yeah, yeah, keep it, be persistent, that's yeah. what you said. Okay, so how, how about you folks, you know, do you have questions uh, for, um, all right, Sophia. Um, so, sorry. 
something that's been really nice about being in captain's class, and I think just like in college in general, is being around people all the time and just being able to like, talk about your ideas before you write them or as you're writing them. Um, and it's something I worry about with like freelancing is just like being in my room and in front of a computer. Um, how do you? How do you involve other people in your writing processes, and when does that happen? <coughs> That's to me one of the big reasons that people pay New York rent as freelancers when they don't have to. I mean, you could live in Peoria as a freelancer, and I'm, I haven't met most of my editors in person until working at the New Yorker. But live, but you get to go to like one of five bars in Clinton Hill, and like you, and there will be other people there who are in your community, and you can mm -hmm. talk about what you're working on. That's a huge. I mean, when I was a freelancer, I would make time to have coffee bar dates with people where we would do laptop stuff to get, or, you know, or just go for a drink with someone, just to have, not in a, like, sleazy networky way, but in a way that's like, I'm running into this problem, would you read my draft? Like, I think that's important in any writer or community. I see you guys know what Oh yeah, move to New York. Yeah, no, yeah, move to New York. Um, but, not literally. Um, <laughs> so stay out. My rent is too high. Um, don't move there. Um, yeah, no, I think that I've, I've talked to some friends who have not moved to New York about how they do this. And they, like, I know so many people who have, like, recreated the exact dynamic of Catherine's class, like, with friends. Like, the exact same protocol. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, they're ripping you off. Um, yeah, no, but but people, you know, and like bring in other people who like, you know, they just meet in their town or whatever, people who they're friendly with who like to write, um, and just create writing groups. You know, I was in a couple um, also reading groups um, when I first um, moved to the city, and it was really nice just to be among people who also were writers. And in some of the early writing groups I was in, um, it was really great to be with people who are not the same kind of writer as me. Um, but it was also like, oh, whoa, this is like a really random group of people. Like, and it kind of, as I found my people, I kind of know now. I like have people who I go to. Um, and yeah, I think you're, you'll, if you so also, sorry. Who did you go to uh, for the piece that you read? Which one? This the one? one that you, oh, this one? Who, who, who did you ask for? Oh, for well, data? so this one, this one was, um, this one was unusual. I, usually I work a lot more in advance kind of with an editor to sort of talk through an idea. Um, but this one just, it was one of those like magic pieces, you know, that just is uncanny. Like I read this interview and I was like, oh, Luisa Moraro, I wonder if she's in this other book that I bought at this bookstore for $4 one day because it looked cool. And it was like, oh yeah, there she's in. And then it was just like, you know, it was just one of those kind of like magic things that happens with research sometimes. Um, so it clicked, and you know, my I work at, at M plus one. There are a lot of a lot of editors, and so who all kind of specialize in different things. You know, like Marco and Nick Nikhil speak Italian, and they're interested in European literature. Like Keith is always like, I don't get it. Explain it to me more simply. And like, so you know, I was like, okay, this is a really good challenge. Like, how do I write this piece? Like the version that is commensurate to the work, but that makes sense to everybody. And so I really just like wrote with that voice in my head, which I've internalized after years of working with these people. Was and one then, of them your primary editor? Um, no, I don't. We it don't, was just a group. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I we don't have really like primary <laughs> editors, um, but you know, there are some editors who are better at some things. You know, like. You know, one of my editors is just like masterful at structure. Mm -hmm. Like you can give him a piece and he'll be like, this is all in the wrong order and just like do this and mm -hmm. it's amazing. Um, and then others are line editors, some are quibblers who will just be the kind of, you know, argumentative voice that's like, that's not true, what about this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, so that particular yeah. piece, you didn't have a lot of that. You, that was really pretty much Yeah, that solo. was kind of interesting. solo. But, you know, but I did, you know, and if this was also interesting, you know, now most of the editors I work with are men because my, Dear coworker Carla has left us for the New Yorker, um, and so I was also yeah. I mean, she's, but um, but she, you know, so I was also like, okay, here's this like piece, like this really intense piece about like Italian feminism and like the female symbolic that I'm sending to like five dudes, and they were all really into it, and so I was really glad. Yeah, it was cool. So another question. Oh, I can I just chime in oh, about I'm sorry. Yes, okay. Okay. And I just want to say this because I don't live in New York, and that <laughs> has been like a big 
insecurity for me <laughs> because it's like, oh my gosh, if I don't live in New York, then like I can't actually be a real writer. And because because like I don't have peers, I don't have like the connections, and I don't have a community, and like I feel so alone in DC. And so I've had to like actively you know seek out people to work with and. Um, I did that by taking a writing class um, at GW. Um, it was it was free, so it was awesome, um, and it was a nonfiction writing class. So I took um, a class that was very similar to the other workshops that I'd taken at Brown, and through that class, I met other people who were interested in nonfiction writing. And even up, so the class was just like a semester long, and after the class ended, we kept meeting. And so I have a group of now like five people who I meet with every other week, and we take turns. Um, bringing pieces um, that we are working on. And it's, I mean, it's been really helpful to me because I need a structure. Like, I'm not good at being that, like, sole writer in my room with a computer. Like, I need to know that, like, next Thursday the group is meeting and it's my turn to present. And so that has been helpful. And also, like, your friends from Brown are going to be helpful. Like, I, I often will just send a piece to, like, one of my friends and just be like, hey, I've been working on this, what do you think? And then, like, that one friend will just, like, write it back, write back. So, but I think, like, I can't stress, like, how, like, you, you won't, like, lose your community if you, if you cultivate it and you, like, look for those people. And I think that it, it takes time. Mm -hmm. I feel like D.C. is particularly hard because there is, like, a journalistic community and it's, like, one that is very invested in and, like, into the work that it's doing, which is a very specific kind of writing and journalism. Mm -hmm. um, so it's hard if you are not that kind of, like, writer, journalist, um, to be around all these people who yeah. are like incredibly uh, sort of involved in their work and in this like little ecosystem and it, I mean that like I mean it can be I'm sure yeah, politically you feel this all the time but you're just less, you're like these people are almost into the same things as me but not quite and it's actually this huge chasm that like you can sort of fall into in yeah. a really dark way. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah, definitely. It's all encouraging. <laughs> We have a lot of people who would really love to ask you, so go ahead. What, uh, Sam and then lady in the back. Come here. Go ahead, Sam. Um, so I guess this question is mostly for Dana, but because your piece was like more about arts, but also for anyone. I'm wondering like if you were if you were like interested in studying theory in college, but obviously like academia is not what you've ended up doing, like how do you sort of like negotiate the difference between like like sort of like more in depth or like more broad theory and like very of the moment arts criticism and like do you ever feel like where I don't know do you ever feel like criticism is like less important or more important than theory or like what is it? I don't know do you have any feelings about that yeah I have lots of feelings about that um, <laughs> yeah I think one of the things that attracted me to N plus one and made me want to stay was that it had this kind of toe in academia while not being kind of immersed in it completely, like being, you know, concerned with reaching a more general audience. Um, and so I, you know, I still care a lot about theory. A lot of people who read M plus one I think care about theory. Um, but I think that one thing that's nice about being discouraged from that just by, you know, writing after college is that I think theory and the way that we're taught in school really discourages or like really kind of facilitates and encourages this kind of like dismantling kind of reading where it's like everything is just like uncovering the truth, you know, the hermeneutics of suspicion. But not only that, but just like having really high standards where like most of stuff like sucks because um, you're like reading the greatest work of all time in college and then you have to lower your standards um, and I think it was like really helpful for me to see people at a magazine like M plus one who are trying to um, reconcile these two things and realize that you have to create a culture of like encouragement and positivity that like there's something very negative about theory um, which is part of its power you know it's its critique um, and but you kind of can't live in that. Um, and so, and I think that to be disabused of that is not a terrible thing, but I am still very grateful to the fact that like a lot of the criticism that M plus one does, like if it's not like citing theory, like it's at least heavily influenced by the ideas and interested in ways that these ideas can be instruments like in the world. Um, I'm 
in, I think a lot about how newsrooms are sometimes not very diverse and like there's you know at least in my experiences newsrooms have been pretty white male dominated also like not that diverse as far as like class backgrounds as well and so I, I was just wondering if you guys have encountered that in your work and how you've tried to address that I mean it's interesting too when you think about the whole pipeline into journalism like one of the pipelines is just doing all these unpaid internships and things like that and that in itself is kind of setting up these barriers as far as you know people of different classes yeah um you're right uh it is an incredibly like flawed and nepotistic environment uh in a lot of ways um and yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, I mean, just like going to Brown, for example, you like, you are going to meet people who go into media, and then you're going to know them as your colleagues, and then like, you know, like, you, obviously, like, everyone in this room is like, party to that in some way. Um, I don't know. Um, yeah, I've had like, I mean, I've had specific experiences, like the, the magazine that I worked at, um, for a year has been has been sort of held up as this um, example of like the dismantling of like the white male liberal uh, like liberalism capital L um, environment and um, when I was there it was like it was already I mean all of the criticisms that people have made of the magazine are like on point and yeah um, it like it's true like you know there were no people of color on staff um, and there is a sort of way of like nodding towards um, diversity or like gender parity as like especially now that that's sort of like a, a conversation that's happening like in like like made like in mainstream media for in like a new way or a way that it hasn't happened in a while um, I think that people like people in these old in these institutional organizations um, like don't really know what to do because everything that they have like benefited from um, is like predicated on the existence of that <coughs> and so there's this like cynical nod to diversity uh, like or like gender parity or um, that like you don't really see as much. I feel like I'm giving you a really like a sort of bleak answer, um, which is not an answer at all. Um, I don't know if you want to like. Yeah, I mean, it's it's tough out there. I think newsrooms are probably worse. I don't know. I've never worked in a newsroom, um, but I can say that it's really up to the organizations themselves if they're going to make that a priority. If they care, you know, I know that N plus one is concerned about that, and I think we've made serious strides you know at several years ago we started blocking out the colleges on people's applic intern applications just because mm -hmm. like whatever like it'll come up in their interview but like we don't need to filter like based on who went to an ivy league school you know just awesome. so we could get people from you know different college different backgrounds to even just interview um i'm also in a group a women's group of editors women who just work and you know editors at different magazines like art magazines whatever and we had this conversation and it's tough like some people are going to be in a position to change the character of a magazine um, but some people aren't you know you can't march into the New York Review of Books or march into TNR and be like we're going to start being interested in this kind of story that you've never been interested in and they're going to perish because they're going to be narrow um, but you know if you are in a position as like an editor or like, somebody working at a, at a publication like you can institute like the kind of measures that will make things you know more equal I think that's the most important thing I mean the, the industry has a huge problem that's like deep and structural and I think if you find yourself in a position of power or near a position of power you just make it your responsibility to keep knocking on that door and not expect it to change immediately but like you just go to every meeting you're invited to and just say like have you thought about this have we covered this has this person written for us yeah like, and it will suck like yeah. it will suck <laughs> yeah people don't want to hear that you'll stuff, be discouraged but. and like made to feel frivolous yeah. and like be embarrassed and you 
kind of just have to keep doing it. Yeah. And, and oh. if you're in a stable enough place where people get repeated exposure to you, the first ten times are like, oh, you would say that, you know, and then eventually <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. they maybe listen, you know. And you have to like, yeah, I mean, if you want to work in a newsroom, you have to like listen to a lot of like, you know, like in an edit meeting, somebody being like, yeah, what about like campus sexual assault? Like, that's a thing we should talk about, like women. And it's like a group of men, like <laughs> making that argument. And then you're sitting there. It's like, they, 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 like you are the like only woman in the room. Are we talking about the sometimes. newsroom, the Sorkin show or the newsroom? <laughs> 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 uh, did that happen on? Did that happen on? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a whole, I mean, I'll tell you that, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> that might, yeah. Something's... Let's have one more question, and then why, why don't you mingle, okay? <laughs> Anybody have a, a nuts and bolts question that you would like to ask the writers? Um, go ahead, Kevin. Uh, so, uh, a number of you have talked about uh, pitching a lot. How do you get from the outright ignore to the, um, to the try again? Yeah. <laughs> Getting to know. Yeah. Uh, there's always a fair amount of ignoring. I don't do it because I've been, you know, like people who have been servers like tip better than other. Like I don't ignore people, but um, um, uh, it's impossible. I mean, people are busy, and freelancers are always their last priority. And you just keep trying, and you try to hone the, your thing to something that they're gonna be interested in. Do you rem see? You're too far away now. Do you remember your first pitches? Oh yeah. I Go ahead. Tell us. I wrote someone, actually this was not a non-connection, this was a like fourth, I met, there was someone who was at a Brown, some net event thing, who worked some, in some capacity at Rolling Stone, and I got his email address and said, hi, I would like to cover uh, Burning Man for Rolling Stone. Uh, I would probably, you know, need, you know, 8,000 words. Um, it was, uh, and uh, Burning Man was happening the same year as the Democratic National Convention, and the theme of Burning Man was American Dream. So I thought that was a nice literary resonance. I still think that would have been a good piece. Um, and you know, I'll drive from one to the other. I'll do it in this very sort of Hunter Thompsony style. Like, you know, that was an ignore. But um, Again, like, I thought a lot about it, and it was, like, kind of a good idea, but, you know, this guy didn't know me. There's no way Rolling Stone is going to, like, if you think in terms of the prerogatives and the needs of the editor, like, editors do need to fill pages, but there's a way that they're going to do it. There are staff writers who are going to get priority over you. There are things that they will not have thought of, things that they will have thought of, things that they will think are necessary versus things that they will think are frivolous, like, and you just get better through trial and error at sort of predicting what those things are going to be. And then finding that line between, hey, it's been two weeks, I'm just checking in, you know, and like, uh, to like getting to a point where it's really annoying and they're gonna like block you. Yeah. yeah. So I, I'll just chime in here because I do like something different than that. Like, mm -hmm. I don't I think ideas are really hard to come up with, especially when you have a full time job and you're immersed in something else. It can be very hard to see something new that other people haven't already seen. So I have to admit, I've not come up with very many good ideas. But that doesn't, what I've been trying to do um, is, is um, what I've been starting with is, is freelancing uh, book reviews and Q and A's because that is, can be a way to kind of get the ball rolling. Um, Without trying, without feeling like you have to have this like brilliant, great idea that nobody else has, and without like spending all this time on this like elaborate pitch that that may end up getting ignored. So um, I found that really helpful to just kind of be like, okay, I know that the next Ferrante book is coming out in September, and I love those books. I'm gonna pitch uh, some book website that's already written about it before, and I'm gonna just say the book's coming out. Here's my qualifications for why I can write this. Here's a couple examples of you know, book reviews I've done before. And I've gotten like really good positive feedback just doing that kind of thing. And if you, if you get no as an answer, um, what I've been trying to do is say, okay, well, if you're not interested in this kind of thing, what are you interested in? Um, if you don't like question and answers and you prefer uh, book reviews, how far in advance do you want me to pitch? Like if the book's coming out in September, do you want me to pitch in July? How, how long do you want it to be? Um, what would I need to do to be qualified to write this for you? Um, so that those kind of just like generating a back and forth have, can be helpful. And also like the idea of like if you pitch an idea and they say no, it's good to have a, 
instead of just being like, okay, thanks for reading, you could write back and be like, well, I got this other idea, and maybe you'll like this one better. Um, it's so really hard. It's embarrassing. And ideas are so hard. But the, so the and the other thing that like I have been working on and have not had success, but I, I it's I'm trying is um, I write uh, personal essays and. Um, those are hard because I don't pitch them. It's not like, hey, I wrote this essay about my cat, um, <laughs> and like, the, this is why this essay about my cat is timely, and this is why, you know, like, it's not. It's like either they like love the piece about the cat and it fits with their publication, or it doesn't. And, you know, then there's no negotiation. And and for those kinds of publications, um, maybe like uh, the Rumpus or like the Toast or like the Hairpin. Those are some sites that like. Are would fit the kind of stuff that I do. Like they don't. There isn't even like an e there isn't even like an editor that you're pitching. Often it's like you go to their submissions page and you just kind of drop your essay into this like pit and you have like <laughs> no idea what happens to it until like four months later you get an email that's like, thanks, we loved your essay about blah blah blah, but it really wasn't a good fit for us. Yeah. You know. And so I think that's when maybe it uh, it's helpful to know like Bob works at the Rumpus. Bob, I wrote this essay like. How do you think we could work on this essay so that it could be a good fit for the rumpus? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So why don't we stop? Uh, thank you very much, guys.